Chapter 14 Issuing of Bodhisattvas from the gaps of the earth out of the multitude of Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas who had flocked from other worlds Bodhisattvas eight times equal to the sands of the river Ganges then rose from the assembled circle their joined hands stretched out towards the Lord to pay him homage they said to him if the Lord will allow us, we also would, after the extinction of the Lord, reveal this Dharma Pariyaya in this Saha world. We would read, write, worship it, and wholly devote ourselves to that law. Therefore, O Lord, deign to grant to us also this Dharma Pariyaya. And the Lord answered, Nay, young men of good family, why should you occupy yourselves with this task? I have here in this Saha world thousands of bodhisattvas equal to the sands of sixty Ganges rivers forming the train of one bodhisattva and of such bodhisattvas there is a number equal to the sands of sixty Ganges rivers each of these bodhisattvas having an equal number in their train who at the end of time at the last period after my extinction shall keep read proclaim this Dharma Pariyaya no sooner had the Lord uttered these words than the Saha world burst open on every side and from within the clefts arose many hundred thousand myriads of kotis of bodhisattvas with gold-colored bodies and the thirty-two characteristic signs of a great man who had been staying in the element of ether underneath this great earth close to this Saha world. These then on hearing the word of the Lord came up from below the earth. Each of these bodhisattvas had a train of thousands of bodhisattvas similar to the sands of sixty Ganges rivers. Each had a troop, a great troop as teacher of a troop, of such bodhisattvas, mahasattvas having a troop, a great troop as teachers of a troop. There were hundred thousands of myriads of kotis equal to the sands of sixty Ganges rivers who emerged from the gaps of the earth in this Saha world. Much more there were to be found in Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas having a train of Bodhisattvas similar to the sands of fifty Ganges rivers. Much more there were to be found of Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas having a train of Bodhisattvas similar to the sands of forty Ganges rivers of thirty to the third power, twenty, ten, five, four, three, two, one Ganges river of one half, one fourth, one sixth, one tenth, one twentieth, one fiftieth, one one hundredth, one one thousandth, one hundred thousandth, one ten uh, millionth, one hundred times ten millionth, one thousand times ten millionth, one hundred times one thousandth times ten millionth, one one hundredth times one thousandth time ten thousandth time ten millionth part of the river Ganges. Much more there were to be found of Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas having a train of many hundred thousand myriads of kotis of Bodhisattvas, of one koti, of one hundred thousand, of one thousand, of five hundred, of four hundred, of three hundred, of two hundred, of one hundred, of fifty, of forty, of thirty, of twenty, of ten, of five, four, three, two, much more there were to be found of Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas having one follower. Much more there were to be found of Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas standing isolated. They cannot be numbered, counted, calculated, compared, known by occult science. The Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, who emerged from the gaps of the earth to appear in this Saha world. And after they had successfully emerged they went up to the stupa of precious substances which stood in the sky where the Lord Prabhataratna the extinct Tathagata was seated along with the Lord Sakyamuni on the throne where after they saluted the feet of both Tathagatas as well as the images of Tathagatas produced by the Lord Sakyamuni from his own body who all together were seated on thrones at the foot of various jewel trees on every side in all directions in different worlds. After these bodhisattvas had many hundred thousand times saluted and thereon circumambulated the Tathagatas, 
from left to right and celebrated them with various bodhisattva hymns. They went and kept themselves at a little distance. The joined hands stretch out to honor the Lord Sakyamuni, the Tathagata, and the Lord Prabhutaratna, the Tathagata. And while those bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, who had emerged from the gaps of the earth, were saluting and celebrating the Tathagatas by various bodhisattva hymns, fifty intermediate kalpas in full rolled away, during which fifty intermediate kalpas, the Lord Sakyamuni, remained silent, and likewise the four classes of the audience. Then the Lord produced such an effect of magical power that the four classes fancied that it had been no more than one afternoon, and they saw this Saha world assume the appearance of hundred thousands of worlds replete with bodhisattvas. The four bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, who were the chiefest of that great host of bodhisattvas, namely the bodhisattva Mahasattva called Vishtakaritra, i.e. of eminent conduct, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva called Anantakaritra, i.e. of endless conduct, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva called Visuddhakaritra, i.e. of correct conduct, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva called Supratishthitakaritra, i.e. of very steady conduct. These four bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, standing at the head of the great host, the great multitude of bodhisattvas stretched out the joined hands towards the Lord and addressed him thus, is the Lord in good health? Does he enjoy well-being and good ease? Are the creatures decorous, docile, obedient, correctly performing their tasks so that they give no trouble to the Lord? And those four bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, addressed the Lord with the two following stanzas. Stanza 1. Does the Lord of the world, the Illuminator, feel at ease? Dost thou feel free from bodily disease, O perfect one? Stanza 2. The creatures, we hope, will be decorous, docile, performing the orders of the Lord of the world, so as to give no trouble. And the Lord answered the four bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, who were at the head of that great host, that great multitude of bodhisattvas. So it is, young man of good family, I am in good health, well-being, and at ease. And these creatures of mine are decorous, docile, obedient, well performing what is ordered. They give no trouble when I correct them. In that young men of good family, because these creatures, owing to their being, already prepared under the ancient, perfectly enlightened Buddhas, have but to see and hear me, to put trust in me, to understand and fathom the Buddha knowledge, and those who fulfilled their duties in the stage of disciples have now been introduced by me into Buddha knowledge and well instructed in the highest truth. And at that time the Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas uttered the following stanzas. 3. Excellent, excellent, O great hero, we are happy to hear that those creatures are decorous, docile, well performing in their duty. 4. And that they listen to thy profound knowledge, O leader, and that after listening to it, they have put trust in it and understand it. This said, the Lord declared his approval to the four bodhisattvas mahasattvas who were at the head of that great host that great multitude of bodhisattvas mahasattvas saying well done young men of good family well done that you so congratulate the tathagata and at that moment the following thought arose in the mind of the bodhisattva mahasattva maitreya and the eight hundred thousand myriads of kotis of bodhisattvas similar to the sands of the river ganges we never yet saw so great a host, so great a multitude of bodhisattvas. We never yet heard of such a multitude that, after issuing from the gaps of the earth, has stood in the presence of the Lord to honor, respect, venerate, worship him, and greet him with joyous shouts. Whence have these bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, flocked hither? Then the bodhisattva, mahasattva, maitreya, Feeling within himself doubt and perplexity and inferring from his own thoughts those of the 800,000 myriads of kotis of bodhisattvas similar to the sands of the river Ganges, stretch out his joined hands towards the Lord and question him about the matter by uttering the following stanzas. 5. 
Here are many thousand myriads of Kotis of Bodhisattvas, numberless, whom we never saw before. Tell us, O Supreme of Men, whence and how did these mighty persons come? Whence have they come here under the form of great bodies? All are great seers, wise and strong in memory, whose outward appearance is lovely to see. Whence have they come? In each of those Bodhisattvas, O Lord of the world, has an immense train, like the sands of the Ganges, the train of each glorious bodhisattva is equal to the sands of sixty ganges in full all are striving after enlightenment of such heroes and mighty possessors of a troop the followers are equal to the sands of sixty ganges there are others still more numerous with an unlimited train like the sands of fifty forty and thirty ganges who have a train equal to the sands of twenty Ganges, still more numerous are the mighty sons of Buddha, who have each a train equal to the sands of ten of five Ganges, whence, O leader, has such an assembly flocked hither. There are others who have each a train of pupils and companions equal to the sands of four, three, or two Ganges. There are others more numerous yet. It would be impossible to calculate their number in thousands of Kotis of Aeons equal to a half Ganges, one-third, one-tenth, one-twentieth, is the train of those heroes, those mighty bodhisattvas. There are yet others who are incalculable. It would be impossible to count them even in hundreds of Kotis of Aeons. Many more yet there are with endless trains. They have in their attendance Kotis and Kotis and again Kotis and also half Kotis. Other great seers, again, beyond computation, very wise bodhisattvas are seen in respectful posture. They have a thousand, a hundred, or fifty attendants, and hundreds of kotis of aeons and wood would not be able to count them. The suite of some of these heroes consists of twenty of ten, five, four, three, or two. Those are countless. Twenty-two. As to those who are walking alone and come to their rest alone, they have now flocked hither in such numbers as to be beyond computation. Even if one with a magic wand in his hand would try for a number of aeons equal to the sands of the Ganges to count them, he would not reach the term. 24. Where do all those noble, energetic heroes, those mighty bodhisattvas come from? Who has taught them the law or duty, and by whom have they been destined to enlightenment? Whose command do they accept? Whose command do they keep? Bursting forth at all points of the horizon. Through the whole extent of the earth they emerge, those great sages endowed with magical faculty and wisdom. This world on every side is being perforated, O seer, by the wise bodhisattvas who at this time are emerging. Never before have we seen anything like this. Tell us the name of this world, O leader. We have repeatedly roamed in all directions. Back up. We have repeatedly roamed in all directions of space, but never saw these bodhisattvas. 30. We never saw a single infant of thine, and now on a sudden these appear to us. Tell us their history, O seer. Hundreds, thousands, ten thousands of bodhisattvas, all equally filled with curiosity, look up to the highest of men. Explain to us, O incomparable great hero, who knowest no bounds, where do these heroes, these wise bodhisattvas come from? Meanwhile, the Tathagatas, who had flocked from hundred thousands of myriads of Kotis of worlds, they, the creations of the Lord Sakyamuni, who were preaching the law to the beings in other worlds, who all around the Lord Sakyamuni, the Tathagata, were seated with crossed legs on magnificent jewel thrones at the foot of jewel trees in every direction of space, as well as the satellites of those Tathagatas were struck with wonder and amazement at the sight of that great host, that great multitude of bodhisattvas emerging from the gaps of the earth and established in the element of ether. And they, the satellites, ask each their own Tathagata, where, O oh Lord, do so many bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, so innumerable, so countless, come from? Whereupon this Tathagata is answered severally to their satellites, wait a while, young men of good family, this bodhisattva, mahasattva here called Maitreya, has just received from the Lord Shakyamuni, a revelation about his destiny to supreme perfect enlightenment. He has questioned the Lord Shakyamuni, the Tathagata, about the matter. And the Lord Shakyamuni, the Tathagata, is going to explain it. Then you may hear. Thereupon the Lord addressed the Bodhisattva Maitreya. Well done, Agita, well done. It is a sublime subject, Agita, about which thou questionest me. 
Then the Lord addressed the entire host of Bodhisattvas, Be attentive, all young men of good family. Be well prepared and steady on your post. You and the entire host of Bodhisattvas, the Tathagata, the Arhat, etc., is now going to exhibit the sight of the knowledge of the Tathagata. Young men of good family, the leadership of the Tathagata, the work of the Tathagata, the sport of the Tathagata, the might of the Tathagata, the energy of the Tathagata. And that occasion, the Lord pronounced the following stanzas. 33. Be attentive, all young men of good family. I am to utter an infallible word. Refrain from disputing about it. O sages, the science of the Tathagata is beyond reasoning. 34. Be all steady and thoughtful. Continue attentive, all. Today you will hear a law as yet unknown, the wonder of the Tathagatas. Never have any doubt, ye sages, for I shall strengthen you. I am the leader who speaketh infallible truth, and my knowledge is unlimited. Profound are the laws known to the Sugata, above reasoning and beyond argumentation. These laws I am going to reveal ye, hear which and how they are. After uttering these stanzas, the Lord addressed the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya. I announce to thee, Agita, I declare to thee, these Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, Agita, so innumerable, incalculable, inconceivable, incomparable, uncountable, whom you never saw before, who just now have issued from the gaps of the earth. These Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, Agita, have I roused, excited, animated, fully developed to supreme perfect enlightenment after my having arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment. In this world, I have moreover fully matured, established, confirmed, instructed, perfected these young men of good family in their bodha, bodhisattva ship. And these bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, agita, occupy in this saw world the domain of the ether element below, only thinking of the lesson they have to study and devoted to. Thoroughly comprehend it, these young men of good family have no liking for social gatherings nor for bustling crowds. They do not put off their tasks and are strenuous. These young men of good family, Agita, delight in seclusion, are fond of seclusion. These young men of good family do not dwell in the immediate vicinity of gods and men, they not being fond of bustling crowds. These young men of good family find their luxury in the pleasure of the law and apply themselves to Buddha knowledge. And on that occasion, the Lord uttered the following stanzas. 37. These bodhisattvas, immense, inconceivable, and beyond measure, endowed with magic power, wisdom, and learning, have progressed in knowledge for many kotis of aeons. It is I who have brought them to maturity for enlightenment, and it is in my field that they have their abode. By me alone they have been brought to maturity. These bodhisattvas are my sons. All have devoted themselves to a hermit life and are assiduous in shunning places of bustle. They walk detached, these sons of mine, following my precepts in their lofty course. Stanza 40. They dwell in the domain of ether, in the lower portion of the field. Those heroes who, unwearied, are striving day and night to attain superior knowledge. All strenuous of good memory, unshaken in the immense strength of their intelligence, those serene sages preach the law, all radiant as being my sons. Since the time when I reached this superior or foremost enlightenment at the town of Gaia, at the foot of the tree and put in motion the all-suppressing wheel of the law I have brought to maturity all of them for superior enlightenment 43 these words I hear speak are faultless really true believe me all of you who hear me verily I have reached superior enlightenment and it is by me alone that all have been brought to maturity the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitriya and those numerous hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of bodhisattvas were struck with wonder, amazement, and surprise, and thought. How is it possible that within so short a moment, within the lapse of so short a time, so many bodhisattvas, so countless, have been roused and made fully ripe to reach supreme perfect enlightenment? Then the bodhisattva mahasattva maitreya asked the Lord, How then, O Lord, has the Tathagata after he left when a prince royal, capital of Astu, the town of the Shakyas, arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment on the summit of the terrace of enlightenment not far from the town of Gaia, somewhat more than forty years since, O Lord. How then has the Lord, the Tathagata, within so short a lapse of time, been able to perform the endless task of a Tathagata to exercise the leadership of a Tathagata, the energy of a Tathagata? How has the Tathagata, within so short a time, been able to rouse and bring to maturity for supreme perfect enlightenment this host of bodhisattvas, this multitude of bodhisattvas? A multitude so great that it would be impossible to count the whole of it, 
even if one were to continue counting for hundred thousands of myriads of cotis of aeons, these bodhisattvas, so innumerable, O Lord, so countless, having long followed a spiritual course of life and planted roots of goodness under many hundred thousands of Buddhas, have in the course of many hundred thousands of aeons become finally ripe. It is just as if some man, young and youthful, a young man with black hair and in the prime of youth, 25 years of age, would represent centenarians as his sons and say, Here, young men of good family, you see my sons. And those centenarians would declare, This is the father who begot us. Now, Lord, the speech of that man would be incredible. Hard to be believed by the public. It is the same case with the Tathagata, but lately has arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment and with these Bodhisattva and Mahasattvas so immense in number who for many hundred thousand myriads of cotis of aeons having observed a spiritual course of life have long since come to certainty in regard to Tathagata knowledge who are able to plunge in and again rise from the hundred thousand sorts of meditation who are adepts at the preparatories to noble transcendent wisdom have accomplished the preparatories to noble transcendent wisdom who are clever on the Buddha ground able in the ecclesiastical council and in Tathagata duties who are the wonder and admiration of the world who are possessed of great vigor strength and power and the Lord says from the very beginning have I roused brought to maturity fully developed them to be fit for this Bodhisattva position it is I who have displayed this energy and vigor after arriving at supreme perfect enlightenment but O Lord how can we have faith in the words of the Tathagata when he says the Tathagata speaks infallible truth the Tathagata must know that the Bodhisattvas who have newly entered the vehicle are apt to fall into doubt on this head. After the extinction of the Tathagata, those who hear this Dharma Pariyaya will not accept, not believe, not trust it. Hence, O oh Lord, they will design acts trending to the ruin of the law. Therefore, O Lord, deign to explain us this matter that we may be free from perplexity and that the Bodhisattvas who in future shall hear it be they young men of good family or young ladies may not fall into doubt on that occasion the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Mantraya addressed the Lord with the following stanzas 44 when thou wert born in Kapila Vastu the home of the Shakyas thou didst leave it and reach enlightenment at the town of Gaia that is a short time ago O Lord of the world stanza 45 and now thou hast so great a crowd of followers these sages who for many cotis of aeons have fulfilled their duties stood in firm in magic power unshaken well disciplined accomplished in the might of wisdom 46 these who are untainted as the lotus is by water who today have flocked hither after rending the earth and are standing all with joined hands respectful and strong in memory of the sons of the master of the world how will these bodhisattvas believe this great wonder expel all doubt tell the cause and show how the matter really is it is as if there were some man a young man with black hair 20 years old or somewhat more presented as his son some centenarians and the latter covered with wrinkles and gray haired declared the young man to be their father but such a young man never having sons of such appearance it would be difficult to believe O lord of the world that they were sons to so young a man in the same manner O oh Lord, we are unable to conceive how these numerous bodhisattvas of good memory and excelling in wisdom, who have been well instructed during thousands of cotis of aeons, who are firm of keen intelligence, lovely and agreeable to sight, free from hesitation, in the decisions on law praised by the leaders of the world, who in freedom live in the wood, who, unattached in the element of ether, constantly display their energy, who are the sons of Sugata, striving after this Buddha ground. 53. How will this be believed when the leader of the world shall be completely extinct? After hearing it from the Lord's own mouth, we shall never more feel any doubt. May Bodhisattvas never come to grief by having doubt on this head. Grant us, O Lord, a truthful account how these Bodhisattvas have been brought to maturity by thee. Chapter 15. Duration of Life of the Tathagata Thereupon the Lord addressed the entire host of Bodhisattvas. Trust me, young men of good family, believe in the Tathagata speaking a veracious word. A second time the Lord addressed the Bodhisattvas. 
Trust me, young gentlemen of good family, believe in the Tathagata, speaking a voracious word. A third and last time the Lord addressed the Bodhisattvas, Trust me, young men of good family, believe in the Tathagata, speaking a voracious word. Then the entire host of Bodhisattvas with Maitreya, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva at their head, stretched out the joined hands and said to the Lord, Expound this matter, O Lord, expound it, O Sugata, we will believe in the word of the Tathagata, a second time the entire host, a third time the entire host, and so on. The Lord, considering that the Bodhisattvas repeated their prayer, up to three times address them thus, listen then, young men of good family. The force of a strong resolve which I assumed is such, young men of good family, that this world, including God's men and demons, acknowledges, now has the Lord Shakyamuni, after going out from the home of the Shakyas, arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment on the summit of the terrace of enlightenment at the town of Gaya. But young men of good family, the truth is that many hundred thousand myriads of cotis of aeons ago, I have arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment by way of example, young men of good family. Let there be the atoms of earth of fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of worlds. Let there exist some man who takes one of those atoms of dust and then goes in an eastern direction, fifty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of worlds further on, there to deposit that atom of dust. Let in this manner the man carry away from all those worlds the whole mass of earth, and in the same manner and by the same act, I suppose, deposit all those atoms in an eastern direction. Now, would you think, young men of good family, that anyone should be able to imagine, weigh, count, or determine the number of those worlds? The Lord, having thus spoken, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya and the entire host of Bodhisattvas replied, They are incalculable, O Lord, those worlds countless beyond the range of thought. Not even all the disciples in Pratyeka Buddha, O Lord, with their Arya knowledge, will be able to imagine, weigh, count, or determine them. For us also, O Lord, who are Bodhisattvas, standing on the place from whence there is no turning back, this point lies beyond the sphere of our comprehension, so innumerable, O Lord, are those worlds. This said, the Lord spoke to those Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, as follows. I announce to you, young men of good family, I declare to you, however numerous, be those worlds where that man deposits those atoms of dust and where he does not there are not young men of good family and all those hundred thousands of myriads of cotis of worlds so many dust atoms as there are hundred thousands of myriads of cotis of aeons since I have arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment from the moment young men of good family when I began preaching the law to creatures in this Saha world and in hundred thousands of myriads of cotis of other worlds and when the other Tathagatas, Arhats, etc., such as the Tathagata, Deepankara, and the rest whom I have mentioned in the lapse of time, preach from that moment, have I, young men of good family, for the complete nirvana of those Tathagatas, created all that with the express view to skillfully preach the law. Again, young men of good family, the Tathagata, considering the different degrees of faculty and strength of succeeding generations, reveals at each generation his own name, reveals a state in which nirvana has not yet been reached and in different ways he satisfies the wants of different creatures through various dharma paryayas this being the case young men of good family the tathagata declares to the creatures whose dispositions are so various and who possess so few roots of goodness so many evil propensities i am young of age monks having left my father's home monks I have lately arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment when, however, the Tathagatas, who so long ago arrived at perfect enlightenment, declares himself to have but lately arrived at perfect enlightenment, he does so in order to lead creatures to full ripeness and make them go in. Therefore, have these Dharma Pariyayas been revealed, and it is for the education of creatures, young men of good family, that the Tathagata has revealed all Dharma Pariyayas, and young men of good family, the word that the Tathagata delivers on behalf of the education of creatures, either under his own appearance or under another's, either on his own authority or under the mask of another. All that the Tathagata declares, all those Dharma Pariyayas spoken by the Tathagata are true. There can be no question of untruth from the part of the Tathagata in this respect. 
For the child of God to seize the triple world as it really is. It is not born. It does not die. It is not conceived. It springs not into existence. It moves not in a whirl. It becomes not extinct. It is not real nor unreal. It is not existing nor non-existing. It is not such nor otherwise nor false. The Tyler God to seize the triple world, not as the ignorant common people. He's, he's seeing things always present to him. Indeed, to the Tyler God in his position, no laws are concealed. In that respect, any word that the Tyler God speaks is true, not false. But in order to produce the roots of goodness in the creatures... Who follow different pursuits and behave according to different notions. He reveals various dharmaparyayas with various fundamental principles. The Tathagata then. Young man of good family does what he has to do. The Tathagata who so long ago was perfectly enlightened is unlimited in the duration of his life. He is everlasting. Without being extinct the Tathagata makes a show of extinction on behalf of those who have to be educated. And even now. Young gentlemen of good family, I have not accomplished my ancient bodhisattva course, and the measure of my lifetime is not full. Nay, young men of good family, I shall yet have twice as many hundred thousand myriads of cotis of aeons before the measure of my lifetime be full. I announce final extinction, young men of good family, though myself I do not become finally extinct, for in this way, young men of good family, I bring all creatures to maturity, less creatures in whom goodness is not firmly rooted, who are unholy, miserable, eager of sensual pleasures, blind and obscured by the film of wrong views, should by too often seeing me take to thinking the Tathagata is staying, and fancy that all is a child's play, lest they by thinking we are near that Tathagata should fail to exert themselves in order to escape the triple world and not conceive how precious the Tathagata is. Hence, young men of good family, the Tathagata, skillfully utters these words the apparition of the tathagatas monks is precious and rare from the course of many hundred thousand myriads of cotis of aeons creatures may happen to see a tathagata or not see him therefore and upon that ground young men of good family i say the apparition of the tathagatas monks is precious and rare by being more and more convinced of the apparition of the tathagatas being precious or rare they will feel surprised and sorry, and whilst not seeing the Tathagata, they will get a longing to see him. The good roots developing from their earnest thought relating to the Tathagata will lastingly tend to their well, benefit, and happiness. In consideration of which the Tathagata announces final extinction, though he himself does not become finally extinct on behalf of the creatures who have to be educated. Such young men of good family is the Tathagata's manner of teaching when the Tathagata speaks in this way. There is from his part no falsehood. Let us suppose an analogous case. Young men of good family, there is some physician, learned, intelligent, prudent, clever, and allaying all sorts of diseases. That man has many sons, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, or 100. The physician once being abroad, all his children incur disease from poison or venom. Overcome with the grievous pains caused by that poison or venom which burns them, they lie rolling on the ground. Their father, the physician, comes home from his journey at the time when his sons are suffering from that poison or venom. Some of them have perverted notions, others have right notions, but all suffer the same pain. On seeing their father, they cheerfully greet him and say, Hail, dear father, thou art come back in safety and welfare. Now deliver us from our evil, be it poison or venom. Let us live, dear father. And the physician, seeing his sons befallen with disease, overcome with pain and rolling the ground, prepares a great remedy. Having the required color, smell, and taste, pounds it on a stone and gives it as a potion to his sons with these words. Take this great remedy, my sons, which has the required color, smell, and taste. For by taking this great remedy, my sons, you shall soon be rid of this poison or venom. You shall recover and be healthy. Those amongst the children of the physician that have right notions after seeing the color of the remedy, after smelling the smell and tasting the flavor, quickly take it and in consequence of it are soon totally delivered from their disease but the sons who have perverted notions cheerfully greet their father and say hail dear father that thou art come back in safety and welfare do heal us so they speak but they do not take the remedy offered and that because owing to the perverseness of their notions that remedy does not please them in color smell nor taste then the physician reflects thus these sons of mine must have become perverted in their notions owing to this poison or venom. 
as they do not take the remedy nor hail me. Therefore will I by some able device induce these sons to take this remedy. Prompted by this desire, he speaks to those sons as follows, I am old young men of good family, decrepit, advanced in years, and my term of life is near at hand. But be not sorry, young men of good family, do not feel dejected here. Have I prepared a great remedy for you? If you want it, you may take it. Having thus admonished them, he skillfully betakes himself to another part of the country and lets his six sons know that he has departed life. They are extremely sorry and bewail him extremely. So then he is dead, our father and protector. He who begat us, he so full of bounty. Now are we left without a protector, fully aware of their being orphans and of having no refuge. They are continually plunged in sorrow by which their perverted notions make room for right notions. They acknowledge that remedy possessed of the required color, smell, and taste to have the required color, smell, and taste that they instantly take it and by taking it are delivered from their evil. Then on knowing that these sons are delivered from evil, the physician shows himself again. Now, young men of good family, what is your opinion? Would anyone charge that physician with falsehood on account of his using that device? No, certainly not, Lord, certainly not, Sugata. He proceeded. In the same manner, young men of good family, I have arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment, since an immense and calculable number of hundred thousands of myriads of cotes of aeons. But from time to time, I display such able devices to the creatures with the view of educating them without their being in that respect any falsehood on my part. In order to set forth this subject more extensively, the Lord on that occasion uttered the following stanzas. <clears throat> Stanza one, an inconceivable number of thousands of cotes of aeons, never to be measured, is it since I reached superior or first enlightenment and never ceased to teach the law. Two, I roused many bodhisattvas and established them in Buddha knowledge. I brought myriads of cotes of beings, endless to full ripeness in many cotes of aeons. Three, I show the place of extinction. I reveal to all beings a device to educate them, albeit... I do not become extinct at the time and in this very place continue preaching the law. There I rule myself as well as all beings, I. But men of perverted minds and their delusion do not see me standing there. In the opinion that my body is completely extinct, they pay worship in many ways to the relics, but me they see not. They feel, however, a certain aspiration by which their mind becomes right. When such upright or pious, mild, and gentle creatures leave off their bodies, then I assemble the crowd of disciples and show myself here on the grid Hirakuta. And then I speak thus to them in this very place. I was not completely extinct at that time. It was but a device of mine, monks. Repeatedly am I born in the world of the living. Stanza 8. Honored by other beings, I show them my superior enlightenment, but you would not obey my word unless the Lord of the world enter nirvana. I see how the creatures are afflicted, but I do not show them my proper being. Let them first have an aspiration to see me, then I will reveal to them the true law. Such has always been my firm resolve during an inconceivable number of thousands of cotes of aeons. And I have not left this grid Rakuta for other a boats. 11. And when creatures behold this world and imagine that it is burning, even then my Buddha field is teeming with gods and men. They dispose of manifold amusements, cotes of pleasure gardens, palaces, and aerial cars. This field is embellished by hills of gems and by trees abounding with blossoms and fruits. And aloft gods are striking musical instruments and pouring a rain of mandaras by which they are covering me, the disciples and other sages who are striving after enlightenment. So is my field here everlastingly, but others fancy that it is burning. In their view, this world is most terrific, wretched, replete with number of woes. I, many cotes of years, they may pass without ever having mentioned my name, the law, or my congregation. That is the fruit of sinful deeds. But when mild and gentle beings are born in this world of men, they immediately see me revealing the law, owing to their good works. I never speak to them of the infinitude of my action. Therefore, I am properly existing since long, and yet declare, the ginas are rare or precious. Such is the glorious power of my wisdom that knows no limit. And the duration of my life is as long as an endless period. I have acquired it after previously following a due course. Feel no doubt concerning it, O sages, and leave off all uncertainty. The world I here pronounce is really true. My word is never false. 20. For even as that physician's skill and devices 
for the sake of his sons whose notions were perverted, so that he had died although he was still alive, and even as no sensible man would charge that physician with falsehood. So am I the father of the world, the self-born, the healer, the protector of all creatures, knowing them to be perverted, infatuated, and ignorant. I, I teach final rest, myself not being at rest. What reason should I have to continually manifest myself? When men become unbelieving, unwise, ignorant, careless, fond of sensual pleasures, and from thoughtlessness run into misfortune, stanza 23, then I, who know the course of the world, declare I am so and so, and consider how can I incline them to enlightenment? How can they become partakers of the Buddha laws? Chapter 16 of Piety while this exposition of the duration of the Tathagata's lifetime was being given, innumerable, countless creatures profited by it. Then the Lord addressed the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitriya. While this exposition of the duration of the Tathagata's lifetime was being given, a Gita, 6,800,000 myriads of Kotis, of Bodhisattvas comparable to the sands of the Ganges, have acquired the faculty to acquiesce in the law that has no origin. A thousand times more, Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas have obtained Dharani and other Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas equal to the dust atoms of one third of a microcosm have, by hearing this Dharma Paryaya, obtain the faculty of unhampered view. Other bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, again equal to the dust atoms of two-third parts of a macrocosm, have by hearing this dharma pariyaya obtained the dharani that makes hundred thousand kotis of revolutions. Again, other bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of a whole macrocosm, have, by hearing this, Dharma Paryaya, moved forward the wheel that never rolls back. Some Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of a mean universe, have, by hearing this Dharma Paryaya, moved forward the wheel of spotless radiance. Other Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of a small universe, have by hearing this Dharma Paryaya come so far that they will reach supreme perfect enlightenment after eight births. Other Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of four worlds of four continents, have by hearing this Dharma Paryaya become such as to require four births more before reaching supreme perfect enlightenment. Other bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of three, four continental worlds, have by hearing this Dharma Paryaya become such as to require three births before reaching supreme perfect enlightenment. Other bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of two, four continental worlds, have by hearing this Dharma Paryaya become such as to require two births more before reaching supreme perfect enlightenment. Other bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of one four continental world have by hearing this Dharma Paryaya become such as to require but one birth before reaching supreme perfect enlightenment. Other bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, equal to the dust atoms of eight macrocosms consisting of three parts have by hearing this Dharma Paryaya conceived the idea of supreme perfect enlightenment no sooner had the Lord given this exposition determining the duration and periods of the law then there fell from the upper sky great rain of Mandarava and great Mandarava flowers that covered and overwhelmed all the hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of Buddhas who were seated on their thrones at the foot of the jewel trees in hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of worlds. It also covered and overwhelmed the Lord Sakyamuni and Tathagata and the Lord Prabhut Aratna, 
the Tathagata, the latter sitting fully extinct on his throne, as well as that entire host of Bodhisattvas in the four classes of the audience. A rain of celestial powder of sandal and agolicum trickled down from the sky whilst higher up in the firmament. The great drums resounded without being struck with a pleasant, sweet, and deep sound. Double pieces of fine heavenly cloth fell down by hundreds and thousands from the upper sky. Necklaces, half necklaces, pearl necklaces, gems, jewels, noble gems, and noble jewels were seen high in the firmament, hanging down from every side in all directions of space, while all around thousands of jewel censers containing priceless, exquisite incense were moving of their own accord. Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas were seen holding above each Tathagata high aloft, a row of jewel umbrellas stretching as high as the Brahma world. So acted the Bodhisattvas Mahasattvas in respect to all the innumerable hundred thousands of myriads of Kotis of Buddhas. Severally, they celebrated these Buddhas in appropriate stanzas, sacred hymns in praise of the Buddhas. And on that occasion, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya uttered the following stanzas. One, wonderful is the law which the Sugata has expounded, the law we never heard before. How great the majesty of the leaders is and how infinite the duration of their life, too. And on hearing such a law imparted by the Sugata, from face to face thousands of Kotis of creatures, the genuine sons of the leader of the world, have been pervaded with gladness. Some have reached the point of supreme enlightenment. From whence there is no return, others are standing on the lower stage, some have reached the standpoint of having an unhampered view, and others have obtained thousands of kotis of Dharanis. There are others as Adams who have reached supreme Buddha knowledge, some again will after eight births become Ginas, seeing the infinite. Among those who hear this law from the Master, some will obtain enlightenment and see the truth after four births, others after three, others after two, six. Some among them will become all-knowing after one birth in the next following existence. Such will be the perfect result of learning the duration of life of the chief. Innumerable, countless as the atoms in the eight fields are the kotis of beings who by hearing this law have conceived the idea of superior enlightenment. Eight. Such is the effect produced by the great seer when he reveals this Buddha state that is endless and has no limit, which is as immense as the element of ether. Many thousand kotis of angels, indras, and brahma angels, like the sands of the Ganges, have flocked hither from thousands of kotis of distant fields and have poured a rain of mandaravas. They move in the sky like birds and strew fragrant powder of sandal and agalicum to cover ceremoniously the chief of Ginas with all. High aloft, Symbols without being struck emit sweet sounds. Thousands of coatees of white cloth whirl down upon the chiefs. Thousands of coatees of jewel censers of costly incense move of their own accord on every side to honor the mighty lord of the world. Innumerable wise bodhisattvas hold myriads of coatees of umbrellas elevated and made of noble jewels like chaplets. Up to the Brahma world, 14, the sons of Sugata in their great joy have attached beautiful triumphal streamers at the top of the banner staffs in honor of the leaders whom they celebrate in thousands of stanzas. 15. Such a marvelous, extraordinary, prodigious, splendid phenomenon, O leader, is being displayed by all those beings who are glad gladdened by the exposition of the duration of life of Tathagata. Grand is the matter now occurring in the ten points of space and great the sound raised by the leaders. Thousands of kotis of living beings are refreshed and gifted with virtue for enlightenment. Thereupon, the Lord addressed the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya. Those beings, Agita, who, during the exposition of this Dharma Pariyaya, in which the duration of the Tathagata's life is revealed, have entertained were it but a single thought of trust, or have put belief in it, how great a merit are they to produce, be they young men and young ladies of good family. Listen then, and mind it well, how great the merit is they shall produce. Let us suppose the case, Igita, that some young man or young lady of good family 
desires of supreme perfect enlightenment for 800,000 myriads of Kotis of Aeon's practices, the five perfections of virtue, paramitas, to wit, perfect charity and alms, perfect morality, perfect forbearance, perfect energy, perfect meditation, perfect wisdom being accepted. Let us, on the other hand, suppose the case of Gita that a young man or young lady of good family, on hearing this Dharma Pariyaya containing the exposition of the duration of the Tathagata's life, conceives, were it but a single thought of trust, or puts belief in it, then that former accumulation of merit, that accumulation of good, connected with the five perfections of virtue, that accumulation which has come to full accomplishment in 800,000 myriads of Kotis of Aeons, does not equal one hundredth part of the accumulation of merit in the second case. It does not equal one thousandth part. It admits of no calculation, no counting, no reckoning, no comparison, no approximation, no secret teaching. One who is possessed of such an accumulation of merit, a Gita, be he, a young man or a young lady of good family will not miss supreme perfect enlightenment. No, that is not possible. And on that occasion, the Lord uttered the following stanza, 17. Let a man who is seeking after this knowledge, superior Buddha knowledge, undertake to practice in this world the five perfect virtues. 18. Let him during 8,000 kotis of complete aeons continue giving repeated alms to Buddhas and disciples. 19. Regaling Pratyaka Buddhas and Kotis of Bodhisattvas by giving meat, food and drink, clothing and lodging. 20. Let him build on earth refuges and monasteries of sandalwood and pleasant convent gardens provided with walks. Let him after so bestowing gifts, various and diversified, during thousands of Kotis of Aeons, direct his mind to enlightenment. Let him then, for the sake of Buddha knowledge, Keep unbroken the pure moral precepts which have been recommended by the perfect Buddhas and acknowledged by the wise. Let him further develop the virtue of forbearance, be steady in the stage of meekness, be constant of good memory, and patiently endure many censures. Let him, moreover, for the sake of Buddha knowledge, bear the contemptuous words of unbelievers who are rooted in pride. Let him always zealous, strenuous, studious of good memory without any other preoccupation in his mind practice meditation during Kotis of Aeons. Let him, whether living in the forest or entering upon a vagrant life, go about avoiding sloth and torpor for Kotis of Aeons. Let him as a philosopher, a great philosopher who finds his delight in meditation and concentration of mind, pass 8,000 Kotis of Aeons. Let him energetically pursue enlightenment with the thought of his reaching all-knowingness and so arrive at the highest degree of meditation. Then the merit occurring to those who practice the virtues oft described during thousands of Kotis of Aeons is less than that of a man or a woman who on hearing the duration of my life for a single moment believes in it. This merit is endless. 31. He who renouncing doubt vacillation and misgiving shall believe even for a short moment shall obtain such a reward the bodhisattvas also who have practiced those virtues during kotis of aeons will not be startled at hearing of this inconceivably long life of mine they will bow their heads and think may I also in future become such a one and release kotis of living beings 34. As the Lord Sakya Muni, the lion of the Sakya race, after he had occupied his seat on the terrace of enlightenment, raised his lion's roar, so may I in future be sitting on the terrace of enlightenment, honored by all mortals to teach so long a life. Those who are possessed of firmness of intention and have learnt the principles will understand the mystery and feel no uncertainty. Again, Agita, he who, after hearing this Dharma Pariyaya, which contains an exposition of the duration of the Tathagata's life, apprehends it, penetrates and understands it, will produce a yet more immeasurable accumulation of merit, conducive to Buddha knowledge, unnecessary to add, that he who hears such a Dharma Pariyaya as this, or makes others hear it, who keeps it in memory, reads, comprehends, or makes others comprehend it who writes or has it written, collects or has it collected into a volume, 
Honors, respects, worships it with flowers, incense, perfumed garlands, ointments, powder, cloth, umbrellas, flax, streamers, lighted oil lamps, ghee lamps, or lamps filled with scented oil will produce a far greater accumulation of merit conducive to Buddha knowledge. And a Gita as a test whether that young man or young lady of good family who hears this exposition of the duration of the Tathagata's life most decidedly believes in it may be deemed the following. They will behold me teaching the law here on the grid Rakuta, surrounded by a host of bodhisattvas, attended by a host of bodhisattvas in the center of the congregation of disciples. They will behold here my Buddha field in the Saha world, consisting of lapis lazuli and forming a level plane, forming a checkered board of eight compartments with gold threads set off with jewel trees. They will behold the towers that the Bodhisattvas use as their abodes. By this test, Agita, one may know if a young man or young lady of good family has a most decided belief. Moreover, Agita, I declare that a young man of good family who, after the complete extinction of the Tathagata, shall not reject, but joyfully accept this Dharma Pariyaya, when hearing it, that such a young man of good family also is earnest in his belief. Far more one who keeps it in memory or reads it, he who after collecting this Dharma Paryaya into a volume, carries it on his shoulder, carries the Tathagata on his shoulder. Such a young man or young lady of good family, a Gita, need make no stupas for me, nor monasteries need not give to the congregation of monks medicaments for the sick or other requisites. For a Gita, such a young man or young lady of good family has spiritually built for the worship of my relics stupas of seven precious substances, reaching up to the Brahma world in height, and with a circumference in proportion with the umbrellas thereto belonging with triumphal streamers with tinkling bells and baskets, has shown manifold marks of respect to those stupas of relics with diverse celestial and earthly flowers incense, perfumed garlands, ointments, powder, cloth, umbrellas, banners, flags, triumphal streamers by various sweet, pleasant, clear-sounding timbals and drums, by the tune, noise, sounds of musical instruments and castanets, by songs, notch, and dancing of different kinds of many innumerable kinds, has done those acts of worship during many innumerable thousands of cotis of aeons. One who keeps in memory this Dharma Pariyaya after my complete extinction, who reads, writes, promulgates it. A Gita shall also have built monasteries, large, spacious, extensive, made of red sandalwood, with thirty-two pinnacles, eight stories, fit for a thousand monks, adorned with gardens and flowers, having walks furnished with lodgings, completely provided with meat, food and drink, and mendicaments, for the sick, well equipped with all comforts, and those numerous innumerable beings, Say a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or a koti or a hundred kotis or a thousand kotis or a hundred thousand kotis or ten thousand times hundred thousand kotis. They must be considered to form the congregation of disciples seeing me from face to face and must be considered as those whom I have fully blessed. He who after my complete extinction shall keep this Dharma Pariyaya, read, promulgate, or write it. He, I repeat, Agita, need not build stupas of relics, nor worship the congregation. Not necessary to tell Agita that the young man or young lady of good family who, keeping this Dharma Paraya, shall crown it by charity and alms, morality, forbearance, energy, meditation, and wisdom, will produce a much greater accumulation of merit. It is, in fact, immense, incalculable, infinite. Just as the element of ether, a Gita, is boundless to the east, south, west, north, beneath, above, and in the intermediate quarters, so immense and incalculable an accumulation of merit, conducive to Buddha knowledge, will be produced by a young man or young lady of good family who shall keep, read, write, or cause to be written this Dharma Pariyaya. He will be zealous in worshipping the Tathagata shrines. He will laud the disciples of the Tathagata, praise the hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of virtues of the Bodhisattvas. Mahasattvas, and expound them to others, he will be accomplished in forbearance, be moral, of good character, agreeable to live with, intolerant, modest, not jealous of others, not wrathful, 
not vicious in mind, of good memory, strenuous and always busy, devoted to meditation and striving after the state of a Buddha, attaching great value to abstract meditation, frequently engaging in abstract meditation, able in solving questions and in avoiding hundred thousands of myriads of kotis of questions. Any Bodhisattva Mahasattva Agita who, after the Tathagata's complete extinction, shall keep this Dharma Pariyaya, will have the good qualities I have described. Such a young man and young lady of good family Agita must be considered to make for the Terrace of Enlightenment. That young man or young lady of good family steps towards the foot of the Tree of Enlightenment in order to reach enlightenment. And where that young man or young lady of good family a Gita stands, sits, or walks, there one should make a shrine dedicated to the Tathagata in the world, including the gods should say, This is a stoop of relics of the Tathagata. And on that occasion, the Lord uttered the following stanzas, 37, An immense mass of merit, as I have repeatedly mentioned, shall be his who, after the complete extinction of the leader of men, shall keep this sutra, 38. He will have paid worship to me and built stupas of relics made of precious substances, variegated, beautiful, and splendid. In height, coming up to the Brahma world with rows of umbrellas, great in circumference, gorgeous and decorated with triumphal streamers, resounding with the clear ring of bells and decorated with silk bands, while jingles moved by the wind form another ornament at the shrines of Gina relics. He will have shown great honor to them by flowers, perfumes, and ointments, by music, clothes, and the repeated sound of cymbals. 42. He will have sweet musical instruments struck at those relics and lamps with scented oil kept burning all around. He who at the period of deprivation shall keep and teach this sutra, he will have paid me such an infinitely varied worship. He has built many kotis of excellent monasteries of sandalwood with 32 pinnacles and 8 terraces high, provided with couches with food hard and soft, furnished with excellent curtains and having cells by thousands. He has given hermitages and walks, embellished by flower gardens, many elegant objects of various forms and variegated. 47. He has shown manifold worship to the host of disciples in my presence. He who after my extinction shall keep this sutra. Let one be ever so good in disposition, much greater merit will he obtain, who shall keep or write the sutra. 49. Let a man cause this to be written, and have it well put together in a volume. Let him always worship the volume with flowers, garlands, ointments. 50. Let him constantly place near it a lamp filled with scented oil, along with full-blown lotuses and suitable oblations of Michelia Champaka. The man who pays such worship to the books will produce a mass of merit which is not to be measured, even as there is no measure of the element of ether in none of the ten directions, so there is no measure of this mass of merit. How much more will this be the case with one who is patient, meek, devoted, moral, studious, and addicted to meditation, who is not irascible, not treacherous, Reverential towards the sanctuary, always humble towards monks, not conceited nor neglectful. Sensible and wise, not angry when he is asked a question, who, full of compassion for living beings, gives such instruction as suits them. If there be such a man who at the same time keeps the sutra, he will possess a mass of merit that cannot be measured. If one meets such a man, as here described, a keeper of the sutra, one should do homage to him. One should present him with divine flowers, cover him with divine clothes, and bow the head to salute his feet in the conviction of his being a Tathagata, 59. And at the sight of such a man, one may directly make the reflection that he is going towards the foot of the tree to arrive at superior blessed enlightenment for the well of all the world, including the gods. And wherever such a sage is walking, standing, sitting, or lying down, Wherever the hero pronounces were it but a single stanza from the sutra, there one should build a stupa for the most high of men, a splendid, beautiful stupa dedicated to the Lord Buddha, the chief, and then worship it in manifold ways. That spot of the earth has been enjoyed by myself. There have I walked myself, and there have I been sitting where that son of Buddha has stayed. There I am. Chapter 17
indication of the meritoriousness of joyful acceptance. Thereupon the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitriya said to the Lord, O Lord, one who, after hearing this Dharma Pariyaya being preached, joyfully accepts it, be that person a young man of good family or a young lady, how much merit, O Lord, will be produced by such a young man or young lady of good family? And on that occasion, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitriya uttered this stanza, stanza one. How great will be the merit of him who, after the extinction of the great hero, shall hear this exalted sutra and joyfully accept it. And the Lord said to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya, If anyone, a Gita, either a young man of good family or a young lady after the complete extinction of the Tathagata, hears the preaching of this Dharma Paryaya, let it be a monk or nun, a male or female lay devotee, a man of ripe understanding or a boy or girl, if the hearer joyfully accepts it and then after the sermon rises up to go elsewhere to a monastery, house, forest, street, village, town, or province, with the motive and express aim to expound the law such as he has understood, such as he has heard it, and according to the measure of his power, to another person, his mother, father, kinsman, friend, acquaintance, or any other person, if the latter, after hearing, joyfully accepts, and in consequence, communicates it to another, if the latter, after hearing, joyfully accepts, and communicates it to another, if this other, again, after hearing, joyfully accepts it, and so on, in succession, until a number of fifty is reached, then... Agita, the fiftieth person to hear and joyfully accept the law so heard, let it be a young man of good family or a young lady, will have acquired an accumulation of merit connected with the joyful acceptance, Agita, which I am going to indicate to thee. Listen and take it well to heart, I will tell thee. It is Agita, as if the creatures existing in the four hundred thousand Asankiyas of worlds in any of the six states of existence, born from an egg, from a womb, from warm humidity, or from metamorphosis, whether they have a shape or have not, be they conscious or unconscious, neither conscious nor unconscious, footless, two-footed, four-footed, or many-footed, as many beings as are contained in the world of creatures, as if all those had flocked together to one place. Further, suppose some man appears a lover of virtue, a lover of good, who gives to that whole body the pleasures, sports, amusements, and enjoyments they desire, like, and relish. He gives to each of them all gambud vipa for his pleasures, sports, amusements, and enjoyments. Gives bullion, gold, silver, gems, pearls, lapis lazuli, conchs, stones, coral, carriages yoked with horses, with bullocks, with elephants, gives palaces and towers. In this way, Agita, that master of munificence, that great master of munificence, continues spending his gifts for fully 80 years. Then Agita, that master of munificence, that great master of munificence reflects thus. All these beings have I allowed to sport and enjoy themselves, but now they are covered with wrinkles and gray-haired, old, decrepit, eighty years of age and near the term of their life. Let me therefore initiate them in the discipline of the law revealed by the Tathagata and instruct them. Thereupon, Agita, the man exhorts all those beings, thereafter initiates them in the discipline of the law revealed by the Tathagata, and makes them adopt it. Those beings learn the law from him, and in one moment, one instant, one bit of time, all become shrota upon us, obtain the fruit of the rank of Sakridagamin and of Anagamin, until they become arhats, free from all imperfections. 
adepts in meditation, adepts in great meditation, and in the meditation with eight emancipations. Now, what is thine opinion, Agita? Will that master of munificence, that great master of munificence, on account of his doings, produce great merit, immense, incalculable merit? Whereupon, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitriya said in reply to the Lord, Certainly, Lord, certainly, Sugata, that person, Lord, will already produce much merit on that account because he gives to the beings the all that is necessary for happiness. How much more than if he establishes them in our hotship? This said, the Lord spoke to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitriya as follows I announce to thee, Agita. I declare to thee, take on one side the master of munificence, the great master of munificence who produces merit by supplying all beings in the 400,000 asan kiyayas of worlds with all the necessities for happiness and by establishing them in our hotship, take on the other side the person who, ranking the 50th in the series of the oral tradition of the law, hears were it but a single stanza, a single word from this Dharma Paryaya and joyfully accepts it. If we compare the mass of merit connected with the joyful acceptance and the mass of merit connected with the charity of the master of munificence, the great master of munificence, then the greater merit will be his who, ranking the 50th in the series, the oral tradition of the law, after hearing it were but a single stanza, a single word, from this Dharma Pariyaya joyfully accepts it. Against this accumulation of merit, Agita, this accumulation of roots of goodness, connected with that joyful acceptance, the former accumulation of merit connected with the charity of that master of munificence. That great master of munificence and connected with the confirmation in our hardship does not fetch the one one hundredth part not the one one hundred thousandth, not the one ten millionth, not the one one billionth, not the one over a thousand times ten million, not the one over a hundred thousand times ten million, not the one over a hundred thousand times ten thousand times ten millionth part. It admits of no calculation, no counting, no reckoning, no comparison, no approximation, no secret teaching. So immense and calculable Gita is the merit which a person ranking the 50th in the series of the tradition of the law produces by joyfully accepting were it but a single stanza, a single word from this Dharma Pariyaya. How much more then will he produce a Gita who hears this Dharma Pariyaya in my presence and then joyfully accepts it? I declare Gita that his accumulation of merit shall be even more immense, more incalculable. And further, Agita, if a young man of good family or a young lady with the design to hear this discourse on the law goes from home to a monastery and there hears this Dharma Paryaya for a single moment, either standing or sitting, then that person, merely by the mass of merit resulting from that action, will after the termination of his present life and at the time of his second existence, when he receives another body, become a possessor of carriages yoked with bullocks. Horses or elephants of litters, vehicles yoked with bulls, and of celestial aerial cars. If further that same person at that moment, preaching sits down, were it but a single moment, to hear this Dharma Pariyaya, or persuades another to sit down or shares with him his seat, he will, by the store of merit resulting from that action, gain seats of Indra, seats of Brahma, thrones of a Kakravartan. And a Gita, if someone, a young man of good family or a young lady, says to another person, Come, friend, and hear the Dharma Pariyaya of the Lotus of the True Law. And if that other person, owing to that exhortation, is persuaded to listen, were it but a single moment, then the former will, by virtue of that root of goodness, Consisting in that exhortation, obtain the advantage of a connection with bodhisattvas who have acquired dharani. He will become the reverse of dull, will get keen faculties and have wisdom in the course of a hundred thousand existences. He will never have a fetid mouth, 
nor an offensive one. He will have no diseases of the tongue, nor of the mouth. He will have no black teeth, no unequal, no yellow, no ill-arranged, no broken teeth, no teeth fallen out. His lips will not be pendulous, not turned inward, not gaping, not mutilated, not loathsome. His nose will not be flat nor wry, his face will not be long nor wry nor unpleasant. On the contrary, Agita, his tongue, teeth, and lips will be delicate and well shaped, his nose long, his face perfectly round, the eyebrows well shaped, the forehead well formed. He will receive a very complete organ of manhood. He will have the advantage that the Tathagata render sermons intelligible to him and soon come in connection with lords, Buddhas. Mark Gita, how much good is produced by one's inciting were it but a single creature. How much more than by him who reverentially hears, reverentially reads, reverentially preaches, reverentially promulgates the law. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas. Listen, how great the merit is of one who, the fiftieth in the series of tradition, hears a single stanza from the Sutra, and with placid mind, joyfully adopts it. Stanza 3. Suppose there is a man in the habit of giving alms to myriads of coatees of beings whom I have here before indicated by way of comparison. All of them he satisfies during eighty years. For then seeing that old age has approached for them, that their brow is wrinkled and their head gray, he thinks, alas, how all beings come to decay. Let me therefore admonish them by speaking of the law. He teaches them the law here on earth and points to the state of nirvana hereafter. All existences, he says, are like a mirage, hasten to become disgusted with all existence. All creatures, by hearing the law from that charitable person, become at once arhats, free from imperfections, and living their last life. Stanza 7. Much more merit than by that person will be acquired by him who through unbroken tradition shall here were it but a single stanza and joyfully receive it. The massive merit of the former is not even so much as a small particle of the latter's. So great will be one's merit, endless and measurable, owing to one's hearing merely a single stanza in regular tradition, how much more than if one hears from face to face. And if somebody exhorts were it but a single creature and says, Go, hear the law, for the sutra is rare in many myriads of cotes of aeons. And if the creature so exhorted should hear the sutra even for a moment, hark what fruit is to result from that action. He shall never have a mouth disease. His tongue is never sore. His teeth shall never fall out, never be black, yellow, unequal. His lips never become loathsome. His face is not wry, nor lean, nor long. His nose not flat. It is well shaped, as well as his forehead, teeth, lips, and round face. His aspect is ever pleasant to men. His mouth is never fetid. It constantly emits a smell sweet as the lotus. Stanza 14. If some wise man to hear this sutra goes from his home to a monastery and there listen, were it but for a single moment with a placid mind, hear what results from it. His body is very fair. He drives with horse carriages, that wise man and is mounted on elevated carriages drawn by elephants and variegated with gems. 16. He possesses litters covered with ornaments and carried by numerous men, such as the blessed fruit of his going to hear preaching. 17. Owing to the performance of that pious work, he shall, when sitting in the assembly there, obtain seats of Indra, seats of Brahma, seats of kings. Chapter 18. The advantages of a religious preacher. The Lord then addressed the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Satata Samita Biyukta, i.e., ever and constantly strenuous. Any one young man of good family who shall keep, read, teach, write this Dharma Paryaya, or have it written, let that person be a young man of good family, or a young lady shall obtain 800 good qualities of the eye, 1,200 of the ear, 800 of the nose, 1,200 of the tongue, 
800 of the body, 1,200 of the mind. By these many hundred good qualities, the whole of the six organs shall be perfect, thoroughly perfect. By means of the natural carnal eye derived from his parents being perfect, he shall see the whole triple universe outwardly and inwardly with its mountains and woody thickets down to the great hell of Viki and up to the extremity of existence. All that he shall see with his natural eye as well as the creatures to be found in it and he shall know the fruit of their works. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas. 1. Hear for me what good qualities shall belong to him who unhesitatingly and undismayed shall preach this sutra to the congregated assembly too. First then his eye or organ of vision shall possess 800 good qualities by which it shall be correct, clear, and untroubled. 3. With the carnal eye derived from his parents he shall see the whole world from within and without. 4. He shall see the Meru and Sumeru, all the horizon and other mountains as well as the seas. 5. He the hero sees all downward to the Aviki and upward to the extremity of existence such as his carnal eye. 6. But he has not yet got the divine eye, it having not yet been produced in him, such as here described as the range of his carnal eye. Further, Satatasam Itaba Yukta, the young man of good family or the young lady who proclaims this Dharma Paryaya and preaches it to others is possessed of the 1200 good qualities of the ear. The various sounds that are uttered in the triple universe downward to the great hell of Viki and upward to the extremity of existence within and without such as the sounds of horses, elephants, cows, peasants, goats, cars, the sounds of weeping and wailing, of horror, of conch trumpets, bells, timbals, of playing and singing, of camels, of tigers, of women, men, boys, girls, of righteousness, piety, and unrighteousness, impiety, of pleasure and pain, of ignorant men and aryas, pleasant and unpleasant sounds, sounds of gods, nagas, goblins, gandharvas, demons, garudas, kinaras, great serpents, men and beings not human, of monks, disciples, pratyaka buddhas, bodhisattvas and tathagatas, as many sounds as are uttered in the triple world within and without, all those he hears with his natural organ of hearing when perfect. Still he does not enjoy the divine ear, although he apprehends the sounds of those different creatures, understands, discerns the sounds of those different creatures, and when with his natural organ of hearing he hears the sounds of those creatures, his ear is not overpowered by any of those sounds. Such, Satata Samita Biyukta, is the organ of hearing that the Bodhisattva Mahasattva acquires, yet he does not possess the divine ear. Thus spoke the Lord, after he, the Sugata, the Master, added, 7. The organ of hearing of such a person becomes or is cleared and perfect, though as yet it be natural. By it he perceives the various sounds without any exception in this world. 8. He perceives the sounds of elephants, horses, cars, cows, goats, and sheep, of noisy kettle drums, tabors, lutes, flutes, valaki, flutes, Nine, he can hear singing lovely and sweet, and at the same time is constant enough not to allow himself to be beguiled by it. He perceives the sounds of kotis of men, whatever and wherever they are speaking. Ten, he moreover always hears the voice of gods and nagas. He hears the tunes, sweet and affecting of song, as well as the voices of men and women, boys and girls. Eleven, he hears the cries of the denizens of mountains and glens, the tender notes of Kalavinkas, cuckoos, peafowls, pheasants, and other birds. Twelve, he also hears the heart-rending cries of those who are suffering pains in the hells and the yells uttered by the spirits, vexed as they are by the difficulty to get food. Thirteen, likewise the different cries produced by the demons and the inhabitants of the ocean. All these sounds, the preacher is able to hear from his place on earth without being overpowered by them. 14. From where he is stationed here on the earth, he also hears the different and multifarious sounds 
through which the inhabitants of the realm of brutes are conversing with each other. 15. He apprehends all the sounds without any exception whereby the numerous angels living in the Brahma world, the Akhanishtas and Avasvaras call one another. 16. He likewise always hears the sound which the monks on earth are raising when engaged in reading and when preaching the law to congregations after having taken orders on the, the command of the Sugata. 17. And when the Bodhisattvas here on earth have a reading together and raise their voices in the general synods, he hears them severally. 18. The Bodhisattva who preaches the Sutra shall at one time also hear the perfect law that the Lord Buddha, the team of men, announces to the assemblies. 19. The numerous sounds produced by all beings in the triple world in this field, within and without, downward to the aviki and upward to the extremity of existence, are heard by him. In short, he perceives the voices of all beings, his ear being open. Being in the possession of his six senses, he will discern the different sources of sound, and that while his organ of hearing is a natural one. 21. The divine ear is not yet operating in him. His ear continues in its natural state, such as here told are the good qualities belonging to the wise man who shall be a keeper of the sutra. Further, Satata Samitaba Buyukta, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, who keeps, proclaims, studies, writes this Dharma Pariyaya, becomes possessed of a perfect organ of smell with 800 good qualities. By means of that organ, he smells the different smells that are found in the triple world within and without, such as fetid smells, pleasant and unpleasant smells, the fragrance of diverse flowers, as the great flower jasmine, Arabian jasmine, Michaelia champaca, trumpet flower, likewise the different scents of aquatic flowers, as the blue lotus, red lotus, white esculent water lily, and white lotus. He smells the odor of fruits and blossoms of various trees bearing fruits and blossoms, such as sandal, xanthochimus, Tabernamontana, Alagolicum, the manifold hundred thousand mixtures of perfumes he smells and discerns without moving from his standing place. He smells the diverse smells of creatures as elephants, horses, cows, goats, beasts, as well as the smell issuing from the body of various living beings in the condition of brutes. He perceives the smells exhaled by the body of women and men, of boys and girls. He smells even from a distance the odor of grass, bushes, herbs, trees. He perceives those smells such as they really are and is not surprised nor stunned by them. Staying on this very earth, he smells the odor of gods and the fragrance of celestial flowers such as Erythrina, Bahinia, Mandurava, and Great Mandurava, Mangusha, and Great Mangusha. He smells the perfume of the divine powders of sandal and agalachum, as well as that of the hundred thousands of mixtures of different divine flowers. He smells the odor exhaled by the body of the gods, such as Indra, the chief of the gods, and thereby knows whether the god is sporting, playing, and enjoying himself in his palace, Vigyanta, or is speaking the law to the gods of paradise in the assembly hall of the gods, Sudharma, or is resorting to the pleasure park for sport. He smells the odor proceeding from the body of the sundry other gods, as well as that proceeding from the girls and wives of the gods, from the youths and maidens amongst the gods, without being surprised or stunned by their smells. He likewise smells the odor exhaled by the bodies of all Devan Ikayas, Brahma Kayikas, and Mahabrahmas. In the same manner, he perceives the smells coming from disciples, Pratyaka Buddhas. Bodhisattvas and Tathagatas. He smells the odor arising from the seats of the Tathagatas and so discovers where those Tathagatas, Arhats, etc. abide. And by none of all those different smells is his organ of smell hindered, impaired, or vexed, and if required, he may give an account of those smells to others without his memory being impaired by it. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas, 22. His organ of smell is quite correct, and he perceives the manifold and various smells, good or bad, which exist in this world. 23. The fragrance of the great flower jasmine, Arabian jasmine, Xanthochimus, sandal, agalatum, of several blossoms and fruits. 24. He likewise perceives the smells exhaled by men, women, boys, and girls at a considerable distance, and by the smell he knows where they are. <coughs> 
25, he recognizes emperors, rulers of armies, governors and provinces, as well as royal princes and ministers, and all the ladies of the harem by their peculiar scent. 26. It is by the odor that the Bodhisattva discovers sundry jewels of things such as are found on the earth and such as serve the jewels for women. 27. That Bodhisattva likewise knows by the odor the various kinds of ornament that women use for their body, robes, wreaths, and ointments. 28. The wise man who keeps this exalted sutra recognizes by the power of a good-smelling organ, a woman, standing, sitting, or lying, he discovers wanton sport and magic power. 29. He perceives at once where he stands the fragrance of scented oils and the different odors of flowers and fruits, and thereby knows from what source the odor proceeds. 30. The discriminating man recognizes by the odor the numerous sandal trees in full blossom in the glens of the mountains as well as all creatures dwelling there. 31. All the beings living within the compass of the horizon or dwelling in the depth of the sea or in the bosom of the earth, the discriminating man knows how to distinguish from the peculiar smell. 32. He discerns the gods and demons and the daughters of demons. He discovers the sports of demons in their luxury. Such indeed is the power of his organ of smell. 33. By the smell he tracks the abodes of the quadrupeds in the woods, lions, tigers, elephants, snakes, buffaloes, cows, gyals. 34. He infers from the odor whether the child that woman, languid from pregnancy, bear in the womb be a boy or a girl. He can discern if a woman is big with a dead child, he discerns if she is subject to throes, and further, if a woman, the pains being removed, shall be delivered of a healthy boy. He guesses the various designs of men. He smells, so to say, an air of design. He finds out the odor of passionate, wicked, hypocritical, or quiet persons. That bodhisattva, by the scent, smells treasures hidden in the ground, money, gold, bullion, silver, chests, and metal pots necklaces of two sorts gems pearls nice priceless jewels he knows by the scent as well as things priceless and brilliant in general 39 that great man from his very place on earth smells the flowers here above in the sky with the gods such as mandaravas mangushakas and those growing on the coral tree 40. By the power of his organ of smell, he, without leaving his stand on earth, perceives how and whose are the aerial cars of lofty, low, and middling size, and other brilliant forms shooting through the firmament. <clears throat> 41. He likewise finds out the paradise, the gods, and the hall of Siddharma, and in the most glorious palace of Vigayanta, and the angels who there are diverting themselves. He perceives here on earth an air of them, by the scent he knows the angels, and where each of them is acting, standing, listening, or walking. That Bodhisattva tracks by the scent the hourists, who are decorated with many flowers, decked with wreaths and ornaments, and in full attire. He knows wherever they are dallying or staying at the time. By smell he apprehends the gods, Brahmas, and Brahmakayas moving on aerial cars aloft upwards to the extremity of existence. He knows whether they are absorbed in meditation or have risen from it. 45. He perceives the Abhasvara, angels falling and shooting and appearing, even those that he never saw before. Such is the organ of smell of the Bodhisattva who keeps this sutra. The Bodhisattva also recognizes all monks under the rule of the Sugata who are strenuously engaged in their walks and find their delight in their lessons and reading. Intelligent as he is, he discerns those among the sons of Gina, who are disciples and those who used to live at the foot of trees, and he knows that the monk so-and-so is staying in such-and-such such a place. The Bodhisattva knows by the odor whether other bodhisattvas are of good memory, meditative, delighting in their lessons and reading, and assiduous in preaching to congregations.
In whatever point of space the Sugata, the great seer, so benign and bounteous, reveals the law in the midst of the crowd of attending disciples, the Bodhisattva, by the odor, recognizes him as the Lord of the universe. Staying on earth, the Bodhisattva also perceives those beings who hear the law and rejoice at it, and the whole assembly of the Jina. Such is the power of his organ of smell, yet it is not the divine organ he possesses, but the natural one prior to the perfect divine faculty of smell. Further, Satatas Amitab Yi Yukta, the young man of good family or the young lady who keeps, teaches, proclaims, writes this Dharma Pariyaya, shall have an organ of taste possessed of 1200 good faculties of the tongue. All flavors he takes in his tongue will yield a divine, exquisite relish. And he tastes in such a way that he is not to relish anything unpleasant. And even the unpleasant flavors that are taken on his tongue will yield a divine relish. And whatever he shall preach in the assembly, the creatures will be satisfied by it. They will be content, thoroughly content, filled with delight. A sweet, tender, agreeable, deep voice goes out from him and amiable voice which goes to the heart at which those creatures will be ravished and charmed and those to whom he preaches after having heard his sweet voice so tender and melodious will even if they are gods be of opinion that they ought to go and see venerate and serve him and the angels and auries will be of opinion etc the indras brahmas and brahmakayikas will be of opinion the Nagas and Naga girls will be of opinion. The demons and their girls will be of opinion. The Garudas and their girls will be of opinion. The Kinaras and their girls. The great servants and their girls. The goblins and their girls. The imps and their girls will be of opinion that they ought to go and see, venerate, serve him, and hear his sermon, and all will show him honor, respect, esteem, worship, reverence, and veneration. Monks and nuns, male and female lay devotees, will likewise be desirous of seeing him. Kings, royal princes, and grandees, or ministers, will also be desirous of seeing him. Kings, ruling armies, and emperors possessed of the seven treasures, along with the princes, royal ministers, ladies of the harem, and their retinue will be desirous of seeing him and paying him their homage. So sweet will be the speech delivered by that preacher, so truthful and according to the teaching of the Tathagata will be his words. Others also, Brahmins and laymen, citizens and peasants, will always and ever follow that preacher till the end of life. Even the disciples of the Tathagata will be desirous of seeing him. Likewise, the Pratyaka Buddhas and the Lord's Buddhas. And wherever that young man of good family or young lady shall stay, there he or she will preach, the face turns to the Tathagata, and he or she will be a worthy vessel of the Buddha qualities. Such so pleasant, so deep will be the voice of the law going out from him. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas. 52. His organ of taste is most excellent, and he will never relish anything of inferior flavor. The flavors are no sooner put on his tongue than they become divine and possessed of a divine taste. 53. He has a tender voice and delivers sweet words, pleasant to hear, agreeable, charming. In the midst of the assembly, he is used to speak with a melodious and deep voice. And whosoever hears him when he is Delivering a sermon with myriads of cotis of examples fills a great joy and shows him an immense veneration. The gods, nagas, demons, and goblins always long to see him and respectfully listen to his preaching. All those good qualities are his. If he would, he might make his voice heard by the whole of the world. His voice is so fine, sweet, deep, tender, and winning. 57. The emperors on earth, along with their children and wives, go to him with the purpose of honoring him and listen all the time to his sermon with joined hands. He is constantly followed by goblins, crowds of nagas, gandharvas, imps, male and female, who honor, respect, and worship him. 
Brahma himself becomes his obedient servant, the gods Isvara and Mahasvara, as well as Indra and the numerous heavenly nymphs, approach him. And the Buddha is benign and merciful for the world, along with their disciples, hearing his voice, protect him by showing their face and feel satisfaction hearing him preaching. Further, Satasamitabha, Biyukta, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, who keeps, reads, promulgates, teaches, writes this Dharma Pariyaya, shall have the 800 good qualities of the body. It will be pure and show a hue clear as the lapis lazuli. It will be pleasant to see for the creatures on that perfect body. You will see the whole triple universe, the beings who in the triple world disappear and appear, who are low or lofty, of good or of bad color in fortunate or in unfortunate condition, as well as the beings dwelling within the circular plane of the horizon and of the great horizon on the chief mountains Meru and Sumeru, and the beings dwelling below in the Aviki and upwards to the extremity of existence. All of them he will see on his own body, the disciples, Pratya, Kabuddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Tathagatas dwelling in the triple universe, in the law taught by those Tathagatas and the beings serving the Tathagatas, he will see all of them on his own body, because he receives the proper body of all those beings and on that account of the perfectness of his body. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas. 61. His body becomes thoroughly pure, clear, as if consisting of lapis lazuli. He who keeps this sublime sutra is always a pleasant sight for all creatures. 62. As on the surface of a mirror an image is seen, so on his body this world. Being self-born, he sees no other being, such as the perfectness of his body. Indeed, all beings who are in this world, men, gods, demons, goblins, the inhabitants of hell, the spirits, and the brute creation are seen reflected on that body. 64. The aerial cars of the gods up to the extremity of existence, the rocks, the ridge of the horizon, the Himalaya, Sumeru, and great Meru all are seen on that body. 65. <clears throat> he also sees the Buddhas on this body, along with the disciples and other sons of Buddha, likewise the Bodhisattvas who lead a solitary life, and those who preach the law to congregations. 66. Such is the perfectness of his body. Though he has not yet obtained a divine body, the natural property of his body is such. Further, Satatasamita Biyukta, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, who after the complete extinction of the Tathagata keeps, teaches, writes, reads this Dharma Pariyaya, shall have a mental organ possessed of 1200 good qualities of intellect. By this perfect mental organ he will, even if he hears a single stanza, recognize its various meanings. By fully comprehending the stanza, he will find in it the text to preach upon for a month, for four months, nay, for a whole year. And the sermon he preaches will not fade from his memory. The popular maxims of common life, whether sayings or counsels, he will know how to reconcile with the rules of the law. Whatever creatures of this triple universe are subject to the mundane world in any of the six conditions of existence, he will know their thoughts, doings, and movements. He will know and discern their motions, purposes, and aims. Though he has not yet attained the state of an aria, his intellectual organ will be thoroughly perfect. And all he shall preach after having pondered on the interpretation of the law will be really true. He speaks what all Tathagatas have spoken. All that has been declared in the sutras of former Guinness. And on that occasion the Lord uttered the following stanzas. His mental organ is perfect, lucid, right, and untroubled. By it he finds out the various laws, low, high, and mean. On hearing the contents of a single stanza, the wise man catches the manifold significations hidden in it, and he is able for a month, four months, or even a year to go on expounding both its conventional and its true sense. And the beings living in this world within or without gods, men, demons, goblins, nagas, brutes, the beings stationed in any of the six conditions of existence, 
All their thoughts the sage knows instantaneously. These are the advantages of keeping this sutra. He also hears the holy sound of the law which the Buddha, marked with a hundred blessed signs, preaches all over the world and he catches what the Buddha speaks. He reflects much on the supreme law and is in the want of constantly dilating upon it. He is never hesitating. These are the advantages of keeping the sutra. He knows the connections and knots. He discerns in all laws contrarieties. He knows the meaning and the interpretations and expounds them according to this knowledge. The sutra which since so long a time has been expounded by the ancient masters of the world is the law which he never flinching is always preaching in the assembly. 75 such is the mental organ of him who keeps or reads the sutra. He is not yet the knowledge of emancipation, but one that precedes it. He who keeps the sutra of the Sugata stands on the stage of a master. He may preach to all creatures and is skillful in cotes of interpretations. Chapter 19 Sada Paributta the Lord then addressed the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Mahastha, Ma, Prapta, in a similar way. Mahastha, Ma, Prapta. One may infer from what has been said that he who rejects such a Dharma Pariyaya as this, who abuses monks, nuns, lay devotees, male or female, keeping this sutra, insults them, treats them with false and harsh words, shall experience dire results to such an extent as is impossible to express in words but those that keep read comprehend teach amply expound it to others shall experience happy results such as i have already mentioned they shall attain such a perfection of the eye ear nose tongue body and mind as just described in the days of yore mahasama prabta at a past period before incalculable aeons nay more than incalculable immense inconceivable and even long before there appeared in the world a tathagata named bhishma gargitasvararaga endowed with science and conduct a sugata in the aeon venir boga in the world mahasambhava now mahasthama Prapta, that Lord Bhishmagar Gitasvara Raga, the Tathagata, in that world, Venir Boga, showed the law in the presence of the world, including gods, men, and demons. The law contained the four noble truths, and starting from the chain of causes and effects, tending to overcome birth, decrepitude, sickness, death, sorrow, lamentation woe grief despondency and finally leading to nirvana he showed to the disciples the law connected with the six perfections of virtue and terminating in the knowledge of the omniscient after the attainment of supreme perfect enlightenment he showed to the bodhisattvas the lifetime of that lord bishma gargita svara raga the Tathagata lasted forty hundred thousand myriads of cotis of aeons, equal to the sands of the river Ganges. After his complete extinction, his true law remained hundred thousands of myriads of cotis of aeons, equal to the atoms contained in Gambu Dvipa, and the counterfeit of the true law continued hundred thousands of myriads of cotis of aeons equal to the dust atoms in the four continents. When the counterfeit of the true law of the Lord Bhishma Gargita Svararaga, the Tathagata, after his complete extinction, had disappeared in the world, Mahasambhava, Mahasthamaprapta, another Tathagata, Bhishma Gargitas Vara Raga Arhat appeared endowed with science and conduct. So in succession, Mahasthama Prapta, 
There arose in that world, Ma Sambhava, twenty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of Tathagatas called Bhishma Gargita Zvararaga. At the time, Mahasthamaraprapta, after the complete extinction of the first Tathagata, amongst all those of the name of Bhishma Gargita Zvararaga, Tathagata, endowed with science and conduct when his true law had disappeared, and the counterfeit of the true law was fading. When the reign of the law was being oppressed by proud monks, there was a monk, a Bodhisattva Mahasattva, called Sada Parabhuta. For what reason Mahasthama Pravta was that Bodhisattva Mahasattva called Sada Parabhuta? It was Mahasthama Pravta because that Bodhisattva Mahasattva was in the habit of exclaiming to every monk or nun, male or female lay devotee while approaching them, I do not contemn you worthies. You deserve no contempt, for you all observe the course of duty of bodhisattvas and are to become Tathagatas. In this way, Mahasama Prapta, that Bodhisattva Mahasattva, when a monk did not teach nor study, the only thing he did was, whenever he descried from afar a monk or nun, a male or female lay devotee, to approach them and exclaim, I do not contemn you, sisters. You deserve no contempt, for you all observe the course of duty of bodhisattvas and are to become tathagatas. So, Mahasthama Prapta, the bodhisattva Mahasattva, at that time used to address every monk or nun, male or female devotee. But all were extremely irritated and angry at it, showed him their displeasure, abused and insulted him. Why does he, unasked, declare that he feels no contempt for us? Just by so doing, he shows a contempt for us. He renders himself contemptible by predicting our future destiny to supreme perfect enlightenment. We do not care for what is not true. Many years, Mahasthama Prapta went on during which that Bodhisattva Mahasattva was being abused but he was not angry at anybody nor felt malignity and to those who when he addressed them in the said manner cast a clod or stick at him he loudly exclaimed from afar I do not contemn you those monks and nuns male and female lay devotees being always and ever addressed by him in that phrase gave him the nickname of Sada Parabhuta. Under those circumstances, Mahasthama Prapta, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Sada Parabhuta, happened to hear this Dharma Paryaya of the Lotus of the True Law when the end of his life was impending and the moment of dying drawing near. It was the Lord Bhishma Gargita Zvararaga, the Tathagata, who expounded this Dharma Paryaya in twenty times, twenty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of stanzas, which the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Sadaparibhuta heard from a voice in the sky when the time of his death was near at hand. On hearing that voice from the sky, without there appearing a person speaking, he grasped this Dharma Paryaya and obtain the perfections already mentioned, the perfection of sight, hearing, smell, taste, body, and mind. With the attainment of these perfections, he at the same time made a vow to prolong his life for twenty hundred thousand myriads of kotis of years, and promulgated this dharma paryaya of the lotus of the true law. And all those proud beings, monks, nuns, male and female lay devotees to whom he had said, I do not contemn you, and who had given him the name of Sada Paribhuta, became all his followers to hear the law after they had seen the power and strength of his sublime magic faculties, of his vow, of his readiness of wit, of his wisdom. All those and many hundred thousand myriads of kotis of other beings were by him roused to supreme perfect enlightenment. Afterwards, Mahasthama Prapta, that Bodhisattva Mahasattva, disappeared from that place and propitiated twenty hundred kotis of Tathagatas, all bearing the same name of 
Khandra Prabhas Vararaga, under all of whom he promulgated this Dharma Paryaya. By virtue of his previous root of goodness, he, in course of time, propitiated twenty hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of Tathagatas, all bearing the name of Dundub is Vararaga, and under all he obtained this very Dharma Paryaya of the Lotus of the True Law and promulgated it to the four classes. By virtue of his previous root of goodness, he again, in course of time, propitiated twenty hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of Tathagatas, all bearing the name of Meghas of Araraga, and under all he obtained this very Dharma Paryaya of the Lotus of the True Law and promulgated it to the four classes. And under all of them, he was possessed of the aforementioned perfectness of sight, hearing, smell, taste, body, and mind. Now, Mahasthama Prapta, that Bodhisattva Mahasattva Sada Piributta, after having honored, respected, esteemed, worshipped, venerated, revered, so many hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of Tathagatas, and after having acted in the same way towards many hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of other Buddhas, obtained under all of them this very Dharma Paryaya of the Lotus of the True Law, and owing to his former root of goodness having come to full development, gained supreme perfect enlightenment, perhaps, Mahas, Dhamma, Prapta, thou wilt have some doubt, uncertainty, or misgiving, and think that he who at that time at that juncture was the Bodhisattva Mahasattva called Sada Parabhuta was one and he who under the rule of that Lord Bhishma Gargita Svararaga the Tathagata was generally called Sada Parabhuta by the four classes by whom so many Tathagatas were propitiated was another but thou shouldest not think so for it is myself who at that time, at that juncture, was the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Sada, Parabhuta. Had I not formally grasped and kept this Dharma Paryaya, Mahasthama, Prapta, I should not so soon have arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment. It is because I have kept, read, preached this Dharma Paryaya derived from the teaching of the ancient Tathagatas. Mahasta Prapta, that I have so soon arrived at supreme perfect enlightenment. As to the hundreds of monks, nuns, male and female lay devotees, Mahasta Prapta, to whom under that Lord the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Sada Parabhuta promulgated this Dharma Paryaya by saying, I do not contemn you. You all observe the course of duty of Bodhisattvas. You are to become Tathagatas, and in whom awoke a feeling of malignity. Towards that Bodhisattva, they in twenty hundred thousand myriads of Kotis of Aeons never saw a Tathagata, nor heard the call of the law, nor the call of the assembly, and for ten thousand Aeons they suffered terrible pain in the great hell of Viki. Thereafter, released from the ban, they by the instrumentality of that Bodhisattva Mahasattva were all brought to full ripeness for supreme perfect enlightenment. Perhaps Mahasattva Prapta, thou wilt have some doubt, uncertainty, or misgiving as to who at that time at that juncture were the persons hooting and laughing at the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. They are in this very assembly the 500 Bodhisattvas, headed by Bhadrapala, the 500 nuns following Simha Khandra, the 500 lay devotees following Sugata Ketana, who all of them have been rendered inflexible in supreme perfect enlightenment. So greatly useful it is to keep and preach this Dharma Paryaya as it tends to result for Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, and supreme perfect enlightenment. Hence, Mahasattva Mahaprapta, the Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas should after the complete extinction of the Tathagata, constantly keep, read, and promulgate this Dharma Paryaya. And on that occasion, the Lord uttered the following stanzas. I remember a past period when King Bhishmasvara, the Gina, lived very mighty and revered by gods and men, the leader of men, gods, goblins, and giants. Two, at that time, succeeding the complete extinction of that Gina, when the decay of the true law was far advanced, 
there was a monk, a bodhisattva, called by the name of Sada Parabhuta. Other monks and nuns who did not believe, but in what they saw, he would approach and say, I never am to contemn you, for you observe the course leading to supreme enlightenment. It was his wont always to utter those words, which brought him but abuse and taunts from their part. At the time when his death was impending, he heard the sutra. The sage then did not expire. He resolved upon a very long life and promulgated the sutra under the rule of that leader and those many persons who only acknowledged the evidence of sensual perception were by him brought to full ripeness for enlightenment. Then disappearing from that place, he propitiated thousands of kotis of Buddhas. Owing to the successive good actions performed by him, and to his constantly promulgating this sutra, that son of Gina reached enlightenment, that bodhisattva then is myself, Sakyamuni. And those persons who only believed in perception by the senses, those monks, nuns, male and female lay devotees, who by the sage were admonished of enlightenment. 9. And who have seen many kotis of Buddhas, are the monks here before me no less than 500 nuns and female lay devotees? 10. All of them have been by me brought to complete ripeness, and after my extinction they will all, full of wisdom, keep this sutra. 11. Not once in many, inconceivably many kotis of ants has such a sutra as this been heard. There are indeed hundreds of kotis of Buddhas, but they do not elucidate this sutra. Therefore, let one who has heard this law exposed by the self-born himself, and who has repeatedly propitiated him promulgate this sutra after my extinction in this world. 